creations that that if we could Sorry be able that. to share that with the licensors, uh, I think it would make, uh, like I said, the, the whole system a lot better, a lot more sensitive to the families, the providers and, and licensing staff. That's good. Yeah, that's great feedback. Sorry about that recording there. I should have pressed that at the very beginning, so. Um... Uh, Gloria, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, like I mentioned, I am a family child care provider, but also I'm working for the Imaging Institute to be the lead of mentors, and I provide the classes for the intern school. They are looking for their license, the child provider license. And yes, what I had to repeat what the another uh, providers mentioned, some licensers do one thing, say one thing, the other licensers do a different thing. And I can hear those many <laughs> different options because I work in like with truly interns and on all is Washington State. And sometimes I think uh, they don't respect what the program has, like let's go to the WAC. We have implemented the policy research and that was approved by DCYF and Imaging Institute, like we have to use that. And many of the licensors didn't know anything about the contract we have with the, the DCYF. And besides the interns presenting the policy gizzard who was approved, they requesting them to do a different packet of policies. Uh, they're requesting a different questions. And in Imaging Institute, we had a Spanish group, English group, Somali group, and some of the Spanish group, the licensors asking them to write everything in English. <laughs> And they are no bilingual and they making a really, really hard time with for them. But what I like somebody mentioned before, some licensors, they are doing a really good job. But another licensor, they are like with all the respect, old fashioned, they want to keep doing what they did in the past. They don't want to be update or renovate. And they keep like making them to do things on their old way and don't respect them. And I believe if we have this meetings and the license will receive a, I don't know how often a training about updates, about new programs, about they have to understand the work and the same thing in one language is going to be easy for us to work all together and start to be, I, I know a lot of providers, they feel afraid about the licensors because they're going to do and they're going to play, complain about this, this and this and start to educate them, guide them, support them. If we receive like providers, we receive more support, support, more guidance, more flexibility. I think we're going to be working together to make a big group or big community or the early learning. And we're going to improve in both ways, this licensed way and provider's way and new applicants. But we have to work together. There's nobody is more, nobody is less. Like we are in the same boat advocating with children and families. And you can mute your microphone, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you very much. Uh, I was saying thank you for sharing. That was that was really great to hear from from your perspective. Um, hold on. It looks like you have your hand raised. Yes, hi, I just want to add, first, first of all, thank you for having me. I think I've only been here twice. Someone is keep inviting me in this space, so um, but thank you, I appreciate that. I work with a lot of uh, home care providers, uh, child care providers that comes in because some of the families that we serve have small children and they attend their centers. So I'm hearing a lot where they do come here. We, I tell them this is not our, our job uh, to, to support them, but what I see the gap is that um, we know that uh, license, um, license, licensors, uh, 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 staffs who are licensors or, or, or don't have the capacity sometimes to pick up phone calls. And we also know that providers are taking care of small children at home. So they need that is urgency that someone needs to pick up the call. But I think where I see the barriers is that the call center should have all this information. I have uh, parents telling me that, uh, providers telling me that they go into the center uh, uh, and trying to figure out what information that they need. 
in order to stay in compliance and it's not there, they have to wait until they talk to the, their licensed uh, person. And that person might be in training, they are probably going out, they don't have the capacity, there's so many cases that they're working with. So um, and they wait for weeks and sometimes months. So I think that, I don't know how, but I think call centers should be trained more and have all this information so that they don't have to wait. You know, if I call in and say, this is my name and this is my license and just go in and they should provide me the information that I need. Um, and also, I've seen also there's a lot of uh, cultural, linguistically uh, diverse family uh, providers that who, who does not understand sometimes some of the steps that our, our call centers are providing and, and, and they're relying on community to support that. So I think having, um, I know earlier you guys talk about information that are translated or interpreter in, in site that can support. And um, again, I know that this is for providers but I think it should be a channel where it's coming from, you know, DCYF um, translation materials to um, childcare providers to families. Because at the end of the day, we're all supporting families. So these people that are, they can't do their work without children being in the house and supporting family. So if you have a Spanish speaking mom, but you provide all this information to the, uh, the childcare provider, but the parents don't have it how does that, you know, that's not consistent and that's, does not align. So I think that families should also get translation information. And I know that child care provider does not have the capacity and the money. DCYF should provide those materials and, and, and translation so they can share with their families. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on. Is, is it pronounced hold on? Am I getting that correct? Yes, it's hold on. Thank All you. All right. Uh... Oh, good. Thank you. That That's really great to hear. Uh, before we move to the next theme, uh, is there anyone else that has something? Oh, it looks like Juliana, I see your hand raised. Um, I was just going to say that um, when you're talking about um, um, the licensors and the call centers, you know, everybody being able to give the same answer, I think... Um, I think one simple solution is just like we have trainings that we have to do. We have the WAC book and, you know, we read it. It's like one lady said that um, they have, you know, like binders, like credit card companies, what have you, they have binders. So like they're Bibles, you know, that they can use. Um, so maybe the licensors can go through what we go through and that they all receive training on how to give the same answers to these questions. Um, uh, and as far as, you know, one's needing it translated because so, a lot of times it does not um, sound the same in, in English as it would sound in Somali, but, you know, there were everybody who has, that would be used as an interpreter. I think if they all took that training that that would, ease things for daycare providers. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have no doubt that on the licensing division and, and Lisa and Dave, of course, could answer this maybe a little more clearly that um, there, there's probably obviously trainings that are provided throughout the process. Um, and, and I don't know if maybe one of you guys could um, shed a little bit of light on, on Aliana's question. So licensors do receive quite a bit of training, obviously, on uh, interpreting WAC. Uh, we also have the inner rater reliability process, which uh, we started a few years ago. It was a little bit uh, interrupted because of COVID and people weren't going out. But that process is to get licensors to be more consistent uh, in how they interpret whack in different providers. Um, and with regards to training on, tra maybe I'm not understanding exactly, but with regards to training on translation, uh, licensors usually will use a translation call line themselves. Um, and we, DCYF, contracts out for that service um, we are in licensing division, you know, also sometimes struggle 
that the interpreter doesn't necessarily understand exactly what we're talking about because they're not trained in uh, child care licensing um, or child care programs. Uh, but currently that's the practice that licensors are trained uh, to do and service to use. Um, and also just to address uh, Susan's comment, uh, with regards to licensors being held to standards of consistency, um, that inner reader reliability uh, process uh, does require licensors to get to a higher level of consistency before they can like graduate out basically of the of the program. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, it looks like Gabe, you have your hand raised. Maybe some. Yeah, just a quick note. The um, and I think we've asked this at a couple of these other meetings before. I just can't remember which one, but I think the transparency of how the individual licensors are being communicated with is something that has been lacking. So I think that because there may be something coming from this level that then goes down to the supervisors, that then goes down to the licensors, there's a lot that can get lost in that inner. Um, in that in that second phase, because those supervisors also interpret things differently, unfortunately. So um, we had asked a couple of times, like, if there's like a monthly newsletter or a monthly communication that's going out to all the licensors that say, hey, this month, you know, we've been hearing X, we really need you to concentrate on this. It'd be great if that could also be provided in not necessarily the exact words, but what has been highlighted over the course of the last month what how are licensors communicated with is it is it monthly is it weekly is it um you know just as things come up because i think it would be great for the providers to actually know um what is being highlighted to them so then they can be prepared to um say hey you know maybe they didn't get that that communication so when they come out and visit say hey you know we heard that you guys have been talking about this in your license like can we talk a little bit about how that might affect us at our program. So I, that might be a part of number one there, the schedule of the quarterly meetings. But I think that there's a pathway for us to be able to kind of understand the communication flow that that is getting to the individual licensors and how that may differ because it's not coming from one central communication. It starts at one central communication spot, but then it, it waterfalls down from there, which I think um, things get a little uh, inconsistent at that point. Yes, Thank you, thanks, Dave. Dave. Yeah. Uh, is it helpful to be responding, Eric? Or do it is. Please do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this. You know, you guys are obviously the subject matter yeah. experts, so um, please feel free to step in and, and help clarify anything you can. Yes, uh, Dave. I totally understand that and agree. You know that the waterfall of communication things can get lost in translation, even if you're not actually translating, right? Um, and uh, one of our practices that we do have is we, I mean, we have policies and procedures and tasks um, that are mostly about like the how of doing work. Um, and then we also use practice memos, which uh, don't, I don't believe get posted publicly on the internet, although our, our policies and practices do. So that's an interesting thought about transparency. I hadn't thought about that. I haven't heard anybody think about that before. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, Lois, it looks like you have your hand raised. I do. Thank you, Eric. Um, so I wanted to find out too, especially around the department's commitment to diversity and racial equity. You know, we have translation has been an ongoing issue as far back as I can remember. And what intentionality is the department putting into hiring um, licensors who are um, dual language and putting and having them placed in communities where they can assist or you know the other piece too is we talk about having that licensing line where folk can call in even if they were staffed at those locations um, and at least the top four to five languages, that in itself would be helpful. I know that would take an investment on the department's um, behalf, but it would definitely be one 
where you would have good returns and, and a way to have positive child outcomes, as well as a better provider licensing experience. Thank you, Lois. Um, it, oh, thank you, Aliza. I just say Julie had a quick question, but it looks like you got to it. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, oh. Go ahead. Anything uh, just that we do. Yet? Yeah, we do. When we're posting uh, hiring for licensors, we'll post a uh, language, you know, if, if you speak that language as well. Um, and we give uh, like additional uh, payment as well, a uh, salary for uh, dual language licensors as well. Yeah. Uh, if possible, if we can find them and hire them too. Thank you. Uh, Lorena, you have your hand raised. Yes, I have a question. Um, before the pandemic, there uh, we had a meeting here. Um, I'm from the Yakima area and uh, we had a meeting here uh, with the providers and the licensors in this area and they were talking about a program where like a pilot program i don't know if that's the same one that you were talking about uh, um or something um i'm not sure but it was a program where they were going to have um one licensor from out of the area coming to kind of supervise the older licensor in this area to go together and they were both going to do the um the inspection and each one of them were going to take notes and at the end of the day they were going to compare but our main licensor was going to stay as our main licensor um is that going to go forward it is something that you guys are still planning to do because we would love to see that i think that will work much better than to to clear all the discrepancies that we've been having and all the misunderstandings with the licensors um it there's a lot of miscommunication, a lot of uh, miswording, and um, we, I, I'm one of the um, providers that had um, meetings with Debbie Graham, with um, Lorena Hernandez here. She's the supervisor licensor here in the Yakima, in Yakima Valley area. And um, I forgot her name, um, but there was a couple of other people that we had um, meetings with with to try to resolve these issues, but I would love to hear that that program it's going to go through or if it's something that we will be looking forward in the future or, you know, why did it stop? I know I understand that it stopped because of the pandemic, but now since everything's back to normal, is that coming back? Is something that you guys are looking for? Yes, Lorena, it is. Uh, that is the, the program we were talking about, Interrate of Reliability or IRR. And yes, we are starting it up again. Um, and uh, Julie, I see the question in the chat. Uh, yes, all licensors um, and supervisors will be uh, required to go through IRR. Um, and I don't know exactly how many months ago your new licensors started, um, but there is definitely like, it's approximately like about three to four months of like not being out in the field. And then depending on the new licensor that's hired, they might be going and doing some tasks associated with, uh, you know, your uh, license, um, but it would be sort of on the job training if uh, if they needed it. And it takes approximately eight months to get a licensor sort of fully trained and onboarded and just running without any additional training that we provide, except for IRR. But they might have a caseload before they do the IRR training? Yes. Licensors have caseloads before they do IRR. It is currently separate from their onboarding and training. Um, we are expanding it, you know, as we... So, I mean, it. I think we all agree it's a nice idea, right? To do IRR with the goal of being, of having licensors become more consistent from person to person to person, but it's troubling that they then will, will have caseloads prior to doing that, um, which I think only... 
strengthens the idea that there needs to be a call line, there needs to be quarterly meetings, so these questions can be asked if somebody hears something weird um, from their own licensor, it can be addressed in one of these quarterly or monthly meetings. Sometimes um, providers will get information or guidance from their licensor that ends up costing the provider money, and then it's incorrect. So this is a real ongoing problematic thing for providers in the field. That's great. Great discussion. Really good. Um, we we're about on track here to move on into the next theme. Uh, we do have a little under two hours left. And for some reason, I had a break scheduled for right now, which is I feel a little too early. So if you're all comfortable with um, continuing and trudging through, then maybe we can take a break after we get through the, the next section. Um, and before I go on, I uh, apologize to you, Juliana, for calling you Aliana um, earlier. I think I, I misspoke your name, so um, I won't we'll do that again. And with that, uh, we will hop into, actually, we have one last question from Lorena in chat. Um, do you have a start date for that program? Maybe Aliza. Oh, yeah, sorry, I was typing it out, but uh, oh. yeah. Uh, the innovator reliability program is happening. Uh, the way that it's structured is we kind of go through batches of people. Um, this is because of sort of how we make sure people are reliable rather than people just being wrong together. Um, and then also, <laughs> um, and then also, uh, you know, we have a federal requirement for licensors to visit every licensed child care program each year. And uh, to double up licensors visiting a program, um, it just capacity wise uh, really is a challenge to do all at once and still uh, meet those other uh, requirements. So uh, it's definitely happening though, currently. Very good. Well, that's a perfect opportunity to move into the next theme. Um, we're, we will have 13 recommendations as part of the next theme, which uh, actually take that back. We still have four, <laughs> four recommendations related to transparency and trust. Um, so again, I'll read through these and uh, give you all a few minutes to digest that, and then we can open up a quick conversation. Um, first, the Provider Support Subcommittee of ELAC should be a partner in creating the outline of the Licensing Division CPS investigation process. Providers should get a report of what feedback influenced policy decisions, funding requests, and programmatic decisions so that they can see how their hard work is affecting DCYF policy. Offer a survey so that providers can review the licensor after the licensing visit. And last, DCYF needs to share more information about the inter-rater reliability training tool for licensors. IRR should be clearly communicated to providers as optional, and DCYF sends a survey to providers to evaluate IRR visits. Um, it looks like we've actually had some discussion on our, our, our um, topic. And so with that, I'll open it up to the room. Anyone um, care to share any feedback? Well, about the survey, I know that we were told that they have in the past sent a survey, but um, I remember asking, who receives the survey results and it, it was an it was not a known answer they didn't know so i feel like we need something in there saying that licensing is going to use the survey data as a tool to better train those licensors that have been um, rated through a survey as needing more training or something I mean, it's a great idea to have a survey, but we want some follow-up. Noted. I know somebody's on mute right now saying something really, really brilliant. Uh, we might have addressed some of this in the earlier conversation as well. I guess I didn't realize there was seven recommendations in this section. Eric, I think I'll just add 
I know that Aliza has provided, you know, answers to some of these concerns, like there's the IR, but clearly there's a problem and the systems that are in place aren't working. And that's really the concern. So rather than hearing what's in place, what I would prefer to hear is we are hearing you that what's in place isn't working and we recognize that we need to change things and fix them. Then I think that also goes further towards trans transparency and trust. Because what I hear are excuses, not solutions. Uh, I'm not trying to be flip here, but that's that's where I think the problem is. The systems, the uh, checks and balances aren't working. And so that's, I think, really the bigger issue here. Not that there are things in there that are supposed to be doing it, they're not. So that's the point I'd like to make. Thanks, Susan. And I sincerely apologize if the um, way that I'm answering questions is indicating that I'm not hearing that it's not working. Absolutely hearing that it's not working. Um, very much looking forward to uh, receiving the final recommendation report. And I think as well, you know, I have some ability to uh, like manage and move a lot of these improvement projects forward, but it is not entirely my decision and some of these also rely on capacity. So I'm also hesitant to provide assurances that certain things will change at this point in this conversation. So I hope that you hear that as well. I'm absolutely hearing that these things aren't working and, and very appreciative of a lot of these uh, recommendations. They are, you know, really fantastic. So. Well, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. So can we change bullet three that says offer a survey? Can we just say a survey should be, a survey will be automatically sent to providers following a monitoring visit? Um, I agree. You know, I, I can't guarantee that we can get that bullet changed. Um, but what I can do is, is find out how easily we, we can make that change. Um, again, the, the report itself is, is already in a review process. Um, I'm not 100% sure if that comes back to me at any point, um, but one item that, that, or I can make sure that if we're not able to change that language in the recommendation report, that we'll make sure that this is followed up on. So as DCYF looks at their response, to the recommendation report, which I do believe is is in in will be part of the process, um, that we can make sure that maybe that small tweak is reflected there. Um, so that way, you know, if and when this particular language gets to the point of of being implemented or being discussed, that that we kind of have it ironed out a little more clearly. Would would that be okay, Julie? Yeah, I'll do my best. How about that? Um, anyone else care to share feedback on these last four recommendations related to transparency and trust? Okay, I have a question. My hand's been up, so you may have thought I just forgot oh, sorry. to sit down. No problem. Thank you, Juliana. No uh -huh. Yes, please but go. I, but, but I am with the second bullet point, uh, bullet point that we should um, get a report uh oh, my, I'm sorry. Are you still there? Yep, we're here. We can hear you. Okay, okay. My um, you're frozen, my, but we can hear you. Okay, my tablet went out for some reason. Okay, now I'm back. But on the second one, how providers should get a report on what feedback and flu <coughs> excuse me, influenced policy decisions. So I um. I would appreciate this because sometimes when policies have been changed, I wonder a lot of times, you know, why, why was this necessary? Is there a way that um, we could get information on when a policy is being considered to be changed? And um, then if, if, we could put have some type of an input in it before a policy is changed, or is the policy just changed because DCYF just feels it's necessary without the provider's input? 
Well, that's a great question. I'm I'm not sure I have the capacity to to answer that. Um, I'm also not sure if anyone here on the call with DCI, DCYF would would be able to shed some light on that. Um, Elisa or Aaron, would either of you be able to provide some context to that? Um, yeah, I can provide some context, and I want to take Susan's uh, advice and acknowledge that we know that this process doesn't work super well. And it's one of the recommendations is that we improve this process of uh, letting people know sort of how policies get changed, et cetera. Um, but what come, what is happening now uh, is that, uh, you know, it also depends which policy you're talking about. So uh, for WAC policy, um, those uh, changes, there are ways for providers to request changes. There are also times where we make uh, changes because of other stakeholders' input or, you know, things change in, in a various ways or if there's a legislative requirement to change our practice as well. Um, and the current system is that uh, we, like, propose a draft of the change and then if you're signed up for our, oh gosh, I wish I could remember what this was exactly, but you can get an email alert and there are periods of public comment anytime we change our WAC. And so that is the current, not super easy to access or know about <laughs> process of how providers uh, can give their input into proposed WAC changes. So how are we alerted to when there is going to be changes? Because there are there, a lot of times there when we get, you know, those newsletters, there's so much information in there. It's to me, I've been doing daycare, you know, 30 plus years, and I have never seen in um, any of the newsletters or anything from DCYS where um, I have the opportunity to put in my opinion as to something that's going to be changed. I think just because it's so much writing, it's so much, um, it's complicated. And I'm sure it would be for even the same for people where English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that process needs to be simplified. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we hear you on that. Gloria, it looks like, did, did you just raise your hand? Yes, also I just wrote a little bit in the chat, but I agree with her. If each sign changes in the web, as like providers, we have to be part about that change and how that is going to benefit our programs, how that change is going to fit our programs, because we are the ones who we will apply and follow those changes and how that is going to benefit us like providers and the children because sometimes when some changes uh i don't know who or give the opinion about okay implementing this in the work but really really that person had experience working with children is be around um, around many children with different ages <laughs> different behavior and that's why they, they providing feedback or providing more support, more tools, or they only have this idea and throw in there and do it. I think we have to have we have to be taken in consideration and listen to us and ask our opinions, ask questions to us because we are we are the ones who want children to be safety, have the safe and healthy, but also not with too many demands because we have enough in our place right now. And yes, it's a lot of high <laughs> standards vocabulary in those works that for providers, it's difficult to understand those high words. And besides, uh, in the second language, English and Spanish or Mali, so different other languages, it's really hard. I think we have to be part of these changes because our opinions matter too. Um, I, 
I just want to jump in if I could clarify anything regarding changes, um, any rulemaking process that DCYF undertakes, regardless of the subject matter, um, is subject to the um, APA. Um, and we and so it the, pu the public always has a chance to comment on any rule change that comes uh, through that pipeline. And the way that you can become notified of that is to sign up for the newsletter. Um, and that's how you can um, keep up with uh, those public comment opportunities, but also want to echo Aliza in that this is feedback we've heard, right? So and we know that there are some improvements that should be made to this process on our end, but um, as far as communicating it out and making sure um, it's easy to access. Um, but uh, as we have those conversations, I just want to encourage people to go ahead and sign up for those newsletters because you can participate. Right. And I think, you know, those of us that have already subscribed know that we can participate, but it's a comment portal. It goes in. You never know if they've even received it, read it, doing anything about it. Pre-COVID, they had community meetings when they were um, doing the the WAC rewrite, not NRM. There were community meetings that allowed for public comment in person. And I think that having these quarterly or monthly meetings with the licensing department would help with that communication barrier because just typing in something into a comment portal doesn't feel very collaborative. Yeah, I was going to agree, Julie, and I was going to say, you know, we've, I mean, we've been talking about this as well, sort of how to start those up again post COVID and, and make them consistently available in different regions as well. Um, and also like, so, and I mean, this is just our thinking, but like what other types of community partners should be there too, if questions come up that are not just childcare licensing specific. Um, so pretty excited to keep going on that one. Well, it's so much easier now that everyone has gotten comfortable on Zoom. I mean, when COVID hit, it was kind of a cluster getting these first webinars going. Um, but, you know, it should be really easy for licensing to do webinars and just trust that providers will be able to mute themselves when they need to and not do a blanket mute on everyone because that just adds to the whole feeling of not being heard. So yeah, community in-person meetings would be great, but Zoom makes it really easy for everyone to participate. So I hope that that's um, definitely the route they go. I agree with that. I, I love Zoom because I think for, for us doing daycare, we are so busy with kids all day long. And then if we have families to take care of, you know, and if we have dinners to do or something like that, Zoom just makes it so much easier because I can just go in a room, shut the door, and I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> so I um, appreciate Zoom very, very much. I do quite a bit by Zoom. So I appreciate that. I just want to kind of jump in there and say that Zoom would be great, um, but I do think we need to keep options open for other people who maybe are even still three years post being the start of COVID, like is technology savvy and that might do better in person. Yeah, well said. Really good. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Oh boy. Um, okay, well, I think this would be a great opportunity to move into the next theme. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that that there's some work to be done here in the transparency and trust space between DCYF and the providers. And I think what's what's really great about the path forward is not only do we have providers providing a, a number of the, the pieces that will help DCYF um, change the way, potentially change the way that some of these processes work. And then at the same time, we have DCYF that's very, very open to this process. And um, as Lisa said, recognizing that there are some some things that could be changed and and modified. Uh, and so I think that the the path forward is is good as long as 
we continue to kind of keep our thumbs on the pulse of this. So um, with that, we will hop into overregulation, which I believe was one of the uh, larger topics and themes. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I know there's several overregulation recommendations. So um, I will, excuse me, read through these five, give you a few minutes to think about them. While you do that, I'm going to run and get a drink of water so I can get this crick out of my throat. Uh, but with that, I will read through these. Licensors should be trained in expectations from other agencies and able to provide information in writing so that they can, <clears throat> excuse me, be a resource to providers who have questions. Build in a growth period for incoming providers who wish to be licensed with gradual requirements. Establish clearly defined timeline goals. Assign a licensor as a technical support representative and a current provider as a mentor. Create a stipend program for mentor organizations to assist new providers. Basic health and safety needs should be in place upon opening a new center. First aid, CPR, food handler card, background checks. Lastly, professional development and education should be a very gradual requirement unless concerns are raised. So with that, I'd like to open it up to the room. Julian, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, I am just thinking about this um, third one where it was assign, assign a license. That's right. <laughs> where it says assign a licensor as a technical support representative and a current provider as a mentor. When I first started doing daycare, and you know, a lot of changes have been made over the years, but the person who was going to be my licensor actually came out to my home looked everything over and you know told me okay do this do that and um get this together get that together that was such a big help and i really appreciated that and i know that you know that's not the case anymore um i don't know if you still i because i remember i think it was the third wednesday of every month you could go to this meeting anybody who wanted to do daycare you went no it was the first Wednesday of the month and they laid out all the rules and regulations and everything and then if you still wanted to do it then you went back the third Wednesday of the month and then you got you know all the forms and everything that you needed to do but having my licensor come out we kind of built a rapport so that when she actually came out and says okay you did good, you did good, you did good. That was such an easy feeling. Now, I didn't have a current provider come as a mentor, but I could definitely see where that would be advantageous because I've, like I said, I've done daycare for years and I have helped people set up um, daycares, but um, both of those would be a very good, um, um, what's the word, uh, encouragement for someone who is wants to open up a home daycare. That's really good feedback. Um, I mean, as you all know, you're, you're small businesses, right? And, and so, you know, running a small business can, can have its, um, its challenges. And I think it would be um, maybe valuable at some point to have, you know, a, a little better defined way of um, how the process works with timelines and, and then the mentorship, I think is a really fantastic recommendation as well. Um, it looks like Brenna, you have your hand raised. Hey there. I was hoping to, this is on a different topic in the recommendation, but ask a question about the professional development. Did you want me to wait? Are you working your way down the list? Oh, uh, no, you're order? more than welcome. Yeah, it's kind of a free for all, <laughs> I guess, for these five regulation or five recommendations. So please. Okay, great. So for the professional development, education uh, should be a very gradual requirement unless concerns are raised. I feel like it's very gradual already. Um, you know, having five years to complete, you know, a few credits. Um, depending on the role and the qualification, the educational qualification. 
that concerns me going beyond where we're already at with that. What is that? I think five years from your first date or data promotion um, by 2026, depending what the timeline is, that seems a little concerning. I feel like this is moving us in a really great motion to propel us towards professionalizing this industry and getting our providers the education and the qualifications they need to benefit them in all areas of their life. So um, this one, I guess I just want a little more information about um, and maybe just put in my two cents, I guess. Thank you, Brenna. Uh, Susan, do you have something to share? Yeah, uh, uh, the first thing was with regard to bullet point number four, I think it what the, what they're saying here is that basic health and safety should be in place upon opening but not all the other stuff because to me so i'm not i'm not i'm unclear of what this is is like create a stipend program for mentor organization to assist new providers then you know at the opening of a new center basic health and safety needs should be in place not i mean i, I guess what i'm concerned about is is are we saying that this is the only thing or that well, I know that when you open and okay, years and years ago, back in 2000, I was still a family home provider. When I went to open my center, I had an empty building. The center was an empty building. Um, I was able to get licensed with an empty building and you can't do that anymore. You have to have all your furniture and all your stuff and everything has to be in there. So environmentally, it's, it's an issue. I think it's um, but then also, um, maybe this is also in regards to the certificate requirements. Maybe that should, maybe that should be on a timeline that doesn't require it be in place the minute they open or before they open. Yeah, I oh, agree that's in the next should... bullet, professional development. I Okay, that's a different one. But I think the create a stipend program for mentor organizations to assist new providers is its own bullet. Yes. And then with regard to the, the concern about, you know, the lengthening when providers can get educated and all of that, what we have to keep in mind there and be careful of is that we don't have equitable access to education, even with some of the supports that are in place with DCYF. And so some of the rules now are um, barriers for particularly uh, BIPOC communities who mm -hmm. are unable to open programs. And so that would be uh, my, I guess, rebuttal to the comment about where we could be causing harm or unintended harm by lengthening the access to education or acquiring education. Yeah, and I would add that there's such a crisis of um, number of spaces in childcare. There should be, I mean, and that's why we create, some of this stuff was written. Um, the Fair Starts for Kids Act wanted a temporary licensing committee because they, they wanted us to be heard, but they also wanted to improve processes so new providers could become licensed more easily. They want to make it easier for people to get in. So I, I think, um, I think a lot of things should be gradual for a new provider because it would it would mean more of the unlicensed folks would be less intimidated to get licensed. Yes. Well said. Uh, Gloria, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yes, it's about the professional development education. Yes, about the new providers. Uh, I know we have some specific education. Like I, I need to talk about my community, Latino community. A lot of, uh, a lot of people, women wants to open a daycare. They don't have a high school education from here. But they had an education from Mexico, but this considered like secondary. Uh, in this country, there's one preparatoria. I think it's called preparatoria. But I was looking about all what they learn here in the high school. We learn over there in middle school, you know, the high school, the 
the topics we're learning here, why we don't accept, why DCYF don't accept those new providers with a secondary certificate and requ request them to have like the 30 hours uh, child care basics right away and maybe 20 or 30 hours or STARS training and related to early childhood education. Because when they are asking about, you need to comply with high school diploma, they have to go to the college, they need, they have to go to the college for a GD, or they have to go someplace else for a high school diploma. They don't want to go back to the school to learn something is not necessary for them. They want to learn something they're going to apply in the job. Why we don't substitute the ones don't have high school diploma have another option about early learning. And maybe with your secondary certificate, get your uh, start working in your initial certificate or start working in 30 or 40 hours and early childhood education. Something else that is more like this is going to use working in the field because going to three, six months, one year to the college to get a GD, that made them frustrated and they give up. They's going better to some place else to work with, to don't request high school diploma. And we have to open these avenues for new people who want to open the business. Now, the ones who we have our license and we have these uh, education requirements for the Latino community and the Somali community in another second language community, it's been really hard to access to classes because it's a waiting list because not all the colleges has uh, bilingual staff for another language and they have, don't have several classes to choose. We have to be in the waiting list until the next quarter or the next quarters. And the, right now we are we have a lot of providers from Wenatchee and from all this Eastern Washington and waiting list on the colleges because they cannot access the short certificate or the early learning class, the initial certificate because it's not a space, it's no bilingual teachers around there to teach them in their own language. It's been a a crisis in there, but I know for the English speakers, it's easy because they had a, a lot of colleges who have classes, um, many classes, but not for the second language students. And I think we have to be very considerate about those communities and have another options. We want to grow this uh, community of learning, but we have to have options too to have the access not to block the access, open access for everyone. Thank you for sharing. That was great. Yeah, I, I'm sure a number of um, those on the on the meeting here would agree. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, another thing, sorry. Um, about the first A in CPR, uh, right now, this is requesting that we have to take these classes in person before we're in Zoom. Uh, it's not easy to find somebody who's going to provide classes in person. Most with the ones we have to repeat it, these classes every two years, every two years. Why they, we don't do the exception, like the ones who have more than two classes in person, they start taking classes uh, online or on Zoom. And the new, new providers who never had experience to have these first A or CPR classes, they have to do them in person because they had to have the guy from the instructor, hands-on and everything. And the another ones, they can have the flexibility to have those online, like we have in those classes in the, in the COVID uh, time, why we have to be in person, like when it's hard for instructors to be everywhere providing these classes and the another thing, instructors who are bilingual, because I think it's another, a lot of English speaking instructors, but they know, too many bilingual instructors. Can be that possibility for providers who has taken these classes for 10, 15, 8, 20 times. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Yasmin, it looks like you have your hand raised. And is it Yasmin or Jasmine? Yeah, it's I've gotten used to Jasmine, but it is Hasmin. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, um, I just kind of was going to touch on some of the same things. I think that Gloria was kind of touching on a little bit, um, possibly why there's that want and desire for extending that professional development time period. Um, just because I know, kind of speaking from the point of view, we are a newer location that just opened up um, and we did have a lot of help from a current director. So we're an extension of a current site. Um, so that was kind of like having a mentor. And so I totally get where that's helpful. Um, but also knowing a lot of things as far as like early achievers and that program and how you can't have that program until you've been established for at least X amount of time and done your reviews and qualify for that program. So I can see why it's problematic for meeting that professional development goal and education guide like limit, because let's say it takes you three years to get to that point because reviews usually only happen every three years. Um, you know, that really only leaves you two years to meet that education limit. Um, and whether we're looking for somebody to have an AA or a BA, and again, that kind of feeds back into how accessible it is for people from different economic backgrounds. And also like Gloria was mentioning about having or not having your high school diploma or your GED. Um, I do believe that depending on the situation, I think some people can try to start taking college courses without necessarily having their GED, but I don't know if that's something that early achievers would cover or not, if it would just kind of be more of them taking course per course. Um, so I can see how that's also kind of hurting a provider or and their employees and why they're not being able to get to where they need to go. Um, and just kind of looking through a lot of the talking points on the overregulation, because like I said, being a newer location that opened up, um, I was heavily involved in the process of like having to purchase all the furniture before being able to come into place. And it was very stressful of like, especially because we are still dealing with lasting effects of COVID um, and supply issues. So a lot of things, you know, I can place an order, but there's really no determining if they're gonna be here in time. So it really was difficult to work through a lot of those kind of steps and processes. I'm really surprised to hear that there's a waiting period to participate in early achievers, being that that's the pathway to be able to accept subsidy I just wonder if you heard that directly from early achievers or I'm you should, be, you should be able to take subsidy. The waiting, the waiting period is, is the cue to get scored. But as soon as you, yeah. the idea is that as soon as you're registered for early achievers, then you become eligible to be able to take the state subsidy. Thanks for explaining that. I was yeah. pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. So I, this Nancy, I put some stuff in the chat. Um, the the issue too around the colleges because i've managed this program as many of you know is um i mean at least at our college in in wenatchee you don't have to have a high school diploma to get into the program you can start taking the initial certificate class or the classes without a high school diploma uh we offer it in an ibes model not just spanish so there would be english and with but spanish supports and interpretation um, the problem with the scholarship is that you have to be in early achievers for at least three months before you can receive the scholarship. So you have to be licensed and you have to purchase either be a work in an early achievers program or if you are an owner, you have to, you know, be in early achievers for three months. Um, so what I dealt with was people who would come in the door and want to open up childcare, but I had no financial resources to help them go to school to get that certificate. And they were coming to my office because that's what they wanted to do. So I do think that's a barrier. And I will say that every community college does it different. So I only know what is done at Wenatchee Valley College. Thank you, Nancy. Brenna, looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to that. Uh, Nancy just spoke to it really well. Um, you guys gave some great points, and I completely understand the inequitable access to the education. But because of that, and then also to 
piggyback off of what Nancy is saying, I'm just wondering if this needs to be, you know, a fifth bullet or put in rather than just a gradual requirement, what about us asking for more access to the education and the requirements? Um, there's the Early Achiever Scholarship and then there's Child Care Aware, uh, Child Care Aware of Washington Scholarship. And like Nancy said, there are stipulations to get either. Um, I've been a, a participant of the Child Care Aware of Washington Scholarship for almost four years. So um, I know a lot about it and I, I preach it to my faculty all the time, but it's not accessible to everyone unless you've worked at a center for a certain amount of time and you meet these guidelines, which aren't super strict, but there are barriers. So I'm just wondering, um, to me, the scholarships are a huge answer to a lot of this and a lot of access to um, education, not necessarily just professional development kind of on a secondary level, but for education, um, I'm just wondering if there should be something in there that states um, more support, more help. How can we get more funding or more scholarships or more equitable access to the scholarships that we already have in place that work and help uh, so many providers? Perhaps that would include then funding for substitute. Part of the problem is, is we have a workforce problem. We don't have a pipeline of staff. So some of the ideas, although are great under different conditions. So like even having funding for, for substitutes to come in. So teachers aren't expected to have to go to class at night when they may be take, needing to take care of their families or they're just plain old dog tired after working with kids for eight hours all day long that um, part of the goal here is it, the Fair Stop for Kids Act, one of the goals is to increase participation of providers in accepting working connections, childcare subsidies. And one of the ways to do that is to remove barriers. And so I think the question here is, is are, we, are we trying to actually, you know, what problems are we trying to solve? And right now I feel like we need to get back to basics just to be able to get people in the door to provide the services because we don't have enough supply of slots to meet the demand and part of the reason why we don't have enough supply is there aren't enough teachers so that's kind of the conundrum we're in and our, i believe we are trying to attempt to address with some of the feedback about over regulation Thank you, Susan. Um, so I don't overregulate you all. Uh, why don't we take a quick six minute break and give everyone a chance to get some water, use the restroom, uh, or just refresh. Uh, and then we'll hop back into the second half of uh, overregulation theme. And we will resume back at three o'clock. Okay, Eric, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Eric, thank can you. I we'll ask you a quick question? You certainly can, yes. Um, so you were saying that the actual recommendation bullets might not be able to be changed at this point, but in the draft report, there are like additional feedback bullets. Are is there the ability to add more clarification there if the subcommittee chooses to do so? Uh, that is a very good question. Um my understanding is well first yes there there are you know within each recommendation in the report there's multiple bullets with with feedback items um my understanding at this point is that any any additional modification um you know change of language or anything like that wouldn't net, wouldn't be able to be changed at this point because of where the process is and the different steps that it's in um however I do know that that we have the ability to to identify a few um, different discussion points that that kind of come from this conversation, and and then what we can do is we can make sure that those are followed up on. Um, I can't necessarily say that they will be in this recommendation report, um, but what I can say is that we will make sure that if it is something that's still hanging out there that we'll make sure that, that it's either in a feedback loop or we bring it back to the committee for another meeting or to ELAC or whatnot. Um, so as of now, mm -hmm. no, we can't change them, um, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of this feedback I think can be very, very valuable because I will make sure that some of the things that come up, I'll be at least 
make sure that I share that information, whether or not the information is used in this process at this stage, I'm not sure. Um, I, I can jump in here. So like I, the, the simple answer is we cannot do, make any changes to the report itself, but what we can do is add an addendum, a follow-up, um, you know, write-up or response that we can share with the same uh, communication good. stream. But as far as like as far as the report itself, door is closed on any uh, modifications there. But uh, but yeah. that doesn't mean there's no room for conversation. You know, we can absolutely yeah. add an addendum or follow up communication about it. Yeah, because there's just some really great points being made yeah. today that haven't been made as explicitly before. So just like really hoping we can capture that maybe in like a transcript or in the recording after um, that I think would be really helpful, you know, for folks who aren't at this meeting to be able to like understand more in depth uh, what the recommendations are, are getting at in like a more specific way, especially around like race and language equity. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, yeah, we we'll can we can write up the minutes, Aliza, and like we can connect also, um, Aliza, since you'd, you'd probably be more well versed in like the best places to send that. Um, but uh, we can do a write up of the feedback here and and uh, collaborate with you to share that out. Yeah, I would love to help with that. Make sure that the insight gets to the right people. So uh, oh, but enjoy your break. See you in three minutes. Okay. Sorry, You're thank in. you for that. Okay, thanks. We'll see you all in a couple minutes. Okay. For those that have just joined us, uh, we are on a very short three minute break and we will resume back at three o'clock. Hello, hello. Uh, we will give everybody a quick moment to make it back. I just switched headphones. Can everyone hear me? Oh, I cannot hear you. Okay. You're good. You're good. Yeah, okay. yeah. There we go. <laughs> I hope you all had a nice short break.
got some water, some coffee, maybe some stretching. Wonderful. Okay, it looks like we may have most of you back. Uh, and to try to keep us on time here, we have about one hour left. And we are about halfway through the recommendation. So we, we do still have quite a few that we're going to be getting to here uh, related to over-regulation and then compensation and provider supports. Um, and so with that, we will take on the second slide of recommendations for over-regulation. Uh, here we have four recommendations. The first, Eliminate unnecessary training and education requirements that may not be necessary to successfully perform the job and do not align with staff compensation. DCYF should only require minimum safety standards and identify other avenues for recognizing and incentivizing providers who go above and beyond. DCYF should eliminate mandates that do not come with funding for providers. The costs for unfunded mandates are passed on to families or absorbed by providers through low wages and few, if any, benefits. Required trainings should qualify for STARS hours, and DCYF should create a stipend system for substitutes who fill in for staff attending training. Notify providers that a licensing visit will take place within 30 to 60 days. So with that, I would open it up to the room. Uh, anyone care to share any feedback? I have one thought, Eric. This is Rebecca Lee. Um, I would, I kind of would like the idea of under notify providers that a licensing visit will take place that, um, that it's a little bit stronger language um, instead of like just notify them, but you know, providers must be made aware or must acknowledge, or I don't know the exact verbiage, but like this is so huge for all of us that somehow I want to say this is the most important thing ever, you know, or something right. that really expresses how critical that is. Yeah, notify is, is, um, isn't real specific. I mean, obviously, the, you know, notify could be a number of different ways. Um, anyone else ha have any additional feedback? Um, I just want to say that I had, I'm trying to find it if we've got it. So I don't know if we've got it or not, but the requirement for an unannounced monitoring visit is a federal requirement for licensing. And so we did ask if we could do announced visits and they said no. And then we did also ask it like if there, if we could give a window and I'm trying to see if we got that answer yet or not. By the time of the feedback loop of the last meeting, we had not received an answer from the, that yet. So still trying to see if that's allowed federally and, and we can uh, continue to poke if we haven't got that answer yet. Well, and if they say that it's not allowed, I would push back because USDA also has unannounced requirements, but they still give us a some kind of um, window, sorry. Yeah, uh, that, we'll oh, definitely go ahead. pass that on to uh, Matt Judge, who is our uh, CCDF coordinator. Yeah. On the first bullet, I know that we talked uh, in the slide previously about um, the education piece for quite a while. This next bullet is actually really asking to really have licensing be about the minimum safety standards and not really about the education piece at all. So I just don't, I know we're seeing them on two different sides. So I just, it's, it can be, I don't know that that, if that will not be confusing to people, because we're kind of asking, is it, is a, is it a, like, we're asking that it's only 
uh, minimum safety standards. But if but if that doesn't happen, then we'd like to, you know, kind of um, uh, renovate the the education and professional development part. Um, it might seem that we're asking for two different things here. I don't know if other see, people see it from that perspective, but I know that we've had a lot of conversation in these meetings about licensing really being about safety standards and that the education piece really kind of lives uh outside that so thank you dave yeah the the report itself when you know when they're reviewing the report they'll actually see these in sequence and so i don't believe they'll be on two different um sections but i will make sure and just as a follow-up um and something maybe that that we'll just note uh that if can, and when we we get into further discussions we can, can you go back to that one really quick just to be able yeah to you bet other, I, and i might be misremembering what it actually says but yeah so yeah, we say professional development and education should be a very gradual requirement unless concerns are raised but then we're we're also asking we'd like it not to actually be part of licensing at all so it's just those two back to back could cause some questions about what we're really asking for okay that's that's good yeah I'll, we'll make a note on there so at you know um as there is additional follow-up from government affairs I, i'm not sure if there necessarily will be um but we'll just make sure that this is at least tracked in minutes um and then followed up on in some capacity and i'm looking here at the recommendation itself and they're actually um well, ironically, they are in two two different pages, so we there there could be a little confusion as there as well. Um, but something we'll maybe let those when they're reviewing this, if they have some further questions on that, then we can clarify from there. Um, uh, this is Sandra Nelson. Uh, mm. I also I also think that when we when we talk about over regulation, I think one of the the issues that we have is what is a requirement and what is practice. So to get to Julie's point, uh, uh, notify providers that a licensing visit will take place within 30, 60 days. We're not asking that you tell us today you're gonna come. Just give us a heads up, it's time for you know your review and we'll be seeing you when we see you type of uh, uh, status on that. Uh, also having a lot of problems with with checking staff information through merit and what's in our hard copy file. We're trying to get away from all of this paper, paperwork too, uh, but merit uh, evidently cannot provide the information that our licensors are looking for. So that, that over-regulation may be uh, a, a symptom of the system we have set up and we need to kind of look at our technical resources too. Thank you, Sandra. That's that's great feedback. Eric, this is Susan. With regard to the point of any potential confusion throughout this document, it might be helpful to have a statement at the beginning saying that there are if there are regulation, there are, there are recommendations that may appear contradictory, but they're there. If one doesn't happen, we want the other one to happen. Mm -hmm. If you know what I'm saying, yeah, you know that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what I can say is we can, I can, we can draft up the the sentence um, or the mm -hmm. statement. I, I can't again guarantee that it will make it into the report. Well, or but we can the least... addendum concept idea because I think sure. Dave's making some really great points. Because like for instance, on the one hand, we're saying eliminate unnecessary training and education requirements as an overregulation thing but in the previous slide we say extend the deadline for when you have to meet the education requirements they are they are not intended to be con conflicting with each other but if we don't remove these education requirements we have to do something yeah yeah that makes sense okay yeah we can definitely make sure that that is included in the in the addendum okay thanks very good. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to interrupt you one more time. Yes. Uh, and see, uh, okay. When a license, when a provider apply for her license, they 
spend a lot of money because of the requirements. But right now they requesting about toys and things about culture is more money extra to they be uh, given the license. And also they made these expenses ahead of time. Most of the providers, they don't have money saved for open a daycare. And they have to wait between 30 days to 90 days to be re reviewed and get the license. Why we don't do that between 60 days, the 30 to 60 days, because they own money, they have to make money and they don't have to wait too long or get the license and start working, attending children and also to making money to pay the, the debts they have. Can be more flexible, more easy for them. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, Arabella, looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, this is Alondra. Sorry, I um, oh. <laughs> I, I missed the, my name. I uh, I couldn't fix it. So no worries. going back to the um, getting providers notified um, of licensing visits. Yeah, like Sandra was saying that we never requested um, the like a specific date for uh, the visits, but it was more like that it would reduce the stress for our staff. Um, it would get um, like we can't really fix things if they're going to find something wrong, they're going to find it uh, with a notification or not. But um, if we're short staff, um, I mean, we can be there, you know, for the licensor when they come because uh, I can leave the room, you know, I rather be with the kids um, and um, like staff to child ratio. So I don't know if Alisa was there when we had that conversation. Um, so I don't know if she's listening. So if she can give a like, uh, uh, like, I don't know how should I say it, but that's okay. What, so are, the talking odds, while she finishes eating. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds of the federal um, getting that approved? Because I know we're not requesting uh, uh, like that specific thing as how, like, I know it's part of the requirements to uh, have those visits and nobody's disagreeing with that, but we want that time frame because it would put less stress on all the providers, the children, staff, everyone. And I mean, if there's something wrong, the parents will make the report. <laughs> so we're not hiding anything, you know, it's just less stressful. We carry with all this requirements, um, new um, uh, yeah. training that we have to take. It's just a lot of things that, I mean, we're just requesting something that it's not, uh, well, for me, it would be a lot helpful. Yeah. It's a personal reasons too. I mean, we cannot go on vacations uh, without feeling stressed or have mm -hmm. like a medical thing going on, a surgery or something, as I was uh, putting that example the last time we spoke about this, because we're not comfortable, you know? So, yeah. I mean, we have a personal life too. And oh. yeah. And I'll say that, so in conversations that I've had with uh, like child care licensing administrators, the idea of providing a notice or a window, um, you know, makes a lot of sense to us too. We are also just waiting for the federal uh, guidance. And I did email the person who needs to do that to remind them to remind the federal government that they still need to get back to us about this. Um, and so that it has happened. And uh, yeah, really, I'm looking forward to uh, giving you all that answer and, you know, apologize on behalf of government employees that uh, it's taken a long time. Yeah, this is Gloria. Thank you for the Alondra, and thank you for who comment. Yes, we really like to have a, a announced visits because when we're working with sick children and the license are coming to our door, sometimes children start acting now 
we cannot unsupervise children to give attention to the licensor. We have to ahead uh, of the time plan and bring another staff to be with our children so while the licensor come and ask the questions and we provide the things they need or do all of the observation and there. But we are working with 12 children, we are two staff. But if we have kids with special needs, we still needing another extra person to come and go with those children and the time the licensor is going to be around because we have to give our attention to the licensor. Because it's going to be a big support if really, really this is what yet is thinking in support providers to please do announce visit to us. We comply with everything we know this year and we don't like to be in a safety place because we are the ones who are going to be on trouble. We follow with all the recommendations, all the what, only we need a little more support. And like she mentioned before, when you're going for a doctor appointment, you really stress, oh, maybe the license will come back. Or oh, we're going to vacation, we're concerned about, I hope everything is going to be fine. I don't want any problem with the license. We need a little relief. We need this is what Jeff trusts us. Have a complete trusting on us, like we're doing things right, and we're going to working collaboration. Thank you for sharing, Gloria. That was really good. Um, Lois, looks like you have your hand up. I do. Thank you, Eric. So I just, Lisa, maybe you can answer this for me, please. Um, I know um, from the federal guidelines, it requires unannounced visits. It does not say how they have to be conducted. It just says they have to be unannounced. So I'm trying to understand why there has to be a waiver from Region 10 or even from DC on allowing providers a 30 or 60 day window that you will be coming to make it an unannounced visit. It is still technically unannounced. It just gives us a time frame. So again, as so many people have shared, we can plan our lives as opposed to, and one thing I do know, like when the USDA, when they come and they perform their audits and they have to observe children, um, let's say back in the day when we were doing family style, if they come in and a provider's trying to do family style, the children will let you know that this is something that they normally don't do. It's, they, it's really obvious. It's like, pass this dish, what do you want, what? And so it's the same thing as someone pointed out, either you have it together or you don't. So, you know, being able to give that courtesy, that professional courtesy, you know, the same as when DCYF staff take vacation, let us know you're on vacation. I'm not working, even though most of you still do. But anyway, that's another issue. I'm just, it's just really important for us to be able to have that. So can you explain to me why there has to be any type of approval from the feds on this when we're still complying with their mandate? That's a great question. I'm gonna hope Aliza may have an answer. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know why we need to ask the feds about this. That really is a Matt Judge question. Um, and I uh, will get an yeah, answer. And I we'll just, I also an just super really hear that this is, uh, would make a big difference. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very much on your side on this. I don't see a reason why not. It makes perfect sense to me. I know that it makes really good sense to a lot of other people at DCYF. And so it's a great recommendation. And I uh, just, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Les, I really don't know. We can ask Matt uh, more specifically why, um, but he did just, I'm on like a, a copied, uh, you know, I'm on the CC line of an email chain and he is pushing um, and they have just replied that they are still waiting back to, for, they are still waiting back uh, to hear from people about that. And, um, you know, I'm, so if you're on a thread with him, can you ask him to provide the language that is causing him to say no right now? 
Yeah, I, I would really yes. like to know that too, because sure. it just, quite frankly, it just simply doesn't make any sense. Um, and I, I can't think of a, a I was trying to think about the process and how I can make it make sense. Because if you think about everything else that the state does, um, you know, I, I think maybe because it was, wasn't part of the original plan, so he has to ask for an amendment. I'm not sure, but it'd be great to know. And maybe that's something that, you know, you can follow up and email us on through CE. Yeah, we'll make sure that 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 we definitely get an answer on that for sure. If if Elise is not able to to grab that, you know, between now and the next 40 minutes. Um, so maybe while she tries to communicate with Matt, we will uh, hop over to the last four recommendations related to overregulation. Um, they are separate violations that are against an individual employee from true violations or complaints against the facility. Violations directly related to a staff person should follow that staff and be viewable by other potential employers. Eliminate the emergency whack around reporting openings and ensure staff members full names are not listed in child care check to protect employee privacy. So with that, I'd love um, to hear some feedback. Okay, so the emergency whack around reporting openings, I would guess the majority of providers are not doing it anyway. Just get rid of it. But the violations being around a staff person is something that would benefit everyone because DC Wife wouldn't be in a position of denying a background check or having a provider say, you know, I just recently hired them and I didn't know that they were, like they didn't know. And maybe they go on to do some really questionable things at their center and then they find out later that they had a history of doing that at their pre previous center, which means they wouldn't have been hired. It feels like that would benefit everyone. Well, except the employee, <laughs> but it would, it would keep kids safe. Yeah, that's, that's a great observation. Um, I think it, it comes down obviously into, into hiring practices. I think that's kind of where that lies. Um, uh, Brenna, looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that that I think it is important. And I've actually been in that position where there was an investigation on an employee that I hired um, and I didn't know anything about it um, until her background didn't come back clear. But we put, um, actually, no, it wasn't until she was added as an employer. There was some kind of delay or something like that. Um, but it, it did put us in an unsafe position and our children in an unsafe position potentially. So I absolutely agree with that. And that um, this should be available in merit. The question is, is how is it available? Because you, you've already hired the person once it's in merit, you've already hired them because they're adding you as their employer. So how would we even get this information prior to hire? Like what database, you know, it's, it's a fair ask, but how realistic is this? And and what, what database or what way can we get this information? And then are we, um, you know, are we violating privacy too? Um, Personally, so I just think that's easily, like I don't hire someone unless they have already put themselves in merit and completed their end of the background check. That's a new practice for me, but that would mean that I would be able to see their work history if DCYF would share it. Absolutely. but. I've had employees take to now, since the fees have been waived, um, we'll have background checks come back super quick now. But I've had people waiting for three months for a status clear. And if you hire someone from out of state or they have had other addresses out of state in the last five years, that is going to set back even more issues. And then you have to send documentation to Arizona, New York, and all these other agencies that are requesting documentation. So 
it doesn't really matter, you know, if you get them in and they've added as an employer or what have you, there's still ways that this could be an issue and it doesn't happen super quickly for everybody. And I can't wait for someone's background to clear before saying, yes, I'd like to hire you. Um, we won't oh, no, I don't, I don't do that. I, once they do their end, I hire them, but I agree with you. There could be definitely problems because some clearances are going to take a long time, but if they would show the work history, if they would at least show the work history and how long they worked at each place, I wouldn't be hiring someone that has worked at every center in my town. Um, I wouldn't be hiring somebody that I can see is jumping from job to job to job with no long work history. So I think there's some merit in it, but you've definitely raised a valid point there. Yeah, great discussion. Um, in, anyone else care to share? It's great firsthand experience. Okay, I believe that will conclude the over-regulation section, but before I say that, let me go to the next slide. Yes, we are going to move on uh, to the last theme, compensation and provider supports. Um, being mindful of all of your time and, and being respectful of our four o'clock end time, uh, which would be about 33 minutes. Um, I believe we have 13 recommendations to, to work through here. Um, and so with that, I'll read the first four. Uh, first recommendation, use quality improvement funds to support the early achievers review process and develop a different avenue to demonstrate quality child care to receive subsidy, not early achievers as the only option. Look at all of the early achievers requirements with an equity lens to incentivize all providers to accept WCCC subsidies, DCYF should increase subsidy payments to 100% now and identify a goal for family participation. To meet the FSKA goal of increasing provider participation in WCCC subsidies, we recommend eliminating participation in early achievers as the requirement to serve children on WCCC subsidies. Anyone care to share? I, uh, this is Sandra Nelson. Um, the uh, equity lens, equity lens for early achievers uh, requirements is long overdue. Um, early achievers has been around for almost 10 years now. Um, and some of the some of the requirements really cause a problem for our center, which is very, very diverse. Uh, so we definitely, definitely want to look at that. Um, but we also want to be mindful that uh, any uh, outcomes don't affect the providers as a, as a non-funded requirement on our end too. So we got to kind of keep that that level so that we don't end up not being able to to uh, uh, be licensed or be part of early achievers because of requirements. Thank you, Sandra. Oh, Gloria, I see your hand raised. Yes, talking about early achievers, uh, it's, a, it's been a challenge right now for many Latino providers to have a coach. They open the daycare, they apply for early achievers, and they keep waiting and waiting and waiting for the coach to come and work with them. They don't have a coach for two years, three years, one year, few months. They, I believe they have a short staff in there but it's one of the requirements, they are compliant. And also another providers who are in level three or three and plus, they receive, we are receiving uh, emails from early achievers, like we had to apply for the review. If we don't, we don't do a review, they are going to take us or grade and put us back. How that is working, like they're going to, <laughs> They're going to put consequences on us 
when we improve our levels and they don't take care about the new providers, but they need a lot of support and a lot of guidance and focusing on them. If they are short in staff, I think they have to be more fair because providers still receiving the minimum page, providing services, having uh, quality services in there, but because they don't have a coach, they don't have a good guy, and they are not, uh, they don't pass in them to level three. How this is going to affect or benefit to us? We want early achievers to benefit us. We don't want early achievers to affect us, but also this program has to renew or renovate uh, it had more extra staff because they have really short on the staff. And one the time when providers call, they, they don't have a coach, they say, yes, we try to hire in coach, but it's been years and they don't have the many coach, coaches they need. How we can help or support, or this is what you how they can support early achievers to grow up, expand, and do the quality services. Thank you, Gloria. Such great feedback today. We appreciate that. I will hop forward to the next four recommendations related to compensation and provider supports. We recommend making early achievers voluntary. In addition, WCCC rate increases for those who achieve early achievers ratings of three to five, three to five or 3.5 should remain and fund the rate increase for level 3.5 as already mandated. DCYF also needs to make funding more equitable, equitable between regions as identified in the cost of quality care study commissioned by the legislature through the Child Care Collaborative Task Force. Merit needs to be fixed to better support providers and increase supports for providers to allow more guidance and accessibility to become licensed. I think we've done a pretty good job so far with the bullets being um, pretty direct in our ask. Uh, those last two, I think we floated a little bit as we've kind of, you know, built this and gone through it. Um, you know, merit needs to get fixed. I think people generally ask, well, <laughs> what, what, what needs to be fixed? So I could just see some questions um, coming up in that uh, in that space, as well as the increased supports for uh, providers to allow more guidance and accessibility to become licensed. So I would just anticipate that we might get some questions there, but um, I think that the overall theme of separating uh, ability to be able to accept state subsidy from early achievers is really the the takeaway um, that I hope that they are um, seeing in these in these pieces. Thank you, Dave. Um, Dave, so just to clarify, in case people aren't realizing this, in the report, there are like multiple bullet points under each. Oh, of that's right. That's right. Yeah, I actually because of, yeah, I, I think I might be floating a little bit at the moment. So I appreciate okay. you saying that out loud again. I obviously <laughs> yeah. saw that piece too. So, OK, perfect. Good. Thank you. Now we're all on the same page. Very good. Um, Okay, so a uh, great discussion in the chat. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elisa, for stepping in. You've been so helpful today. Uh, it looks like we were about a little less than 30 minutes left, and we have about seven recommendations. So we're we're trending right on time to be able to finish. Um, if there is no further discussion on these four recommendations, then I will hop forward to uh, three of the last four. Looks like these are very wordy. Uh, the first, make licensing requirements more achievable by focusing only on the health and safety of children and fund any additional requirements. Should this recommendation be adopted, we further recommend that any new licensing rules that may have a financial impact should also be supported with funding from DCYF. Develop a new team within DCYF solely focused on unlicensed care, which would include imposing fines slash fees for the operation of unlicensed care facilities, notification and education to families, such as unlicensed care campaigns, scouting unlicensed care, et cetera. Require all children, regardless of hours provided in Washington state to be licensed and follow the same rule 
Acts and Regulations of DCYF. That might be children providers, I'm not sure. Um, uh, if exemptions are allowed, a registry of license exempt facilities and providers needs to be created, including an application process, mandated reporter training, CPR first aid training, and background checks. The registry should be updated and maintained regularly and made publicly available. Uh, first, Dave, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, just quick note, if if in the conversation there happens to be questions about just an example of um, the further recommendation that any new licensing rules that may have financial impact, we could use the self-closing and self-latching gates for outdoor play areas. Um, I think that's a pretty easy one for people to understand, but it did have a pretty significant uh financial impact, um, more so than what people maybe probably thought. That wasn't an easy fix in a lot of cases, and fencing has turned into a pretty expensive space. So, Thank you, Dave. And it looks like I kind of misread that third bullet, um, require all, all care of children. So that is written properly. Um, Lorena, it looks like you have your hand up. Yes, um, I just wanted to ask a question. So um, on, this, on the second one, um, I thought there was already um, something implemented about fines for for unlicensed um, places, and um, but there's not a lot of structure and not a lot of um, rules about that. Um, I know a lot of places are, are doing that type of business without being licensed, and it is affecting licensed childcare providers, and um, it it also affects the community taking kids to places that are not licensed, it's it's a hazard. Um, it, and it's an unhealthy, unsafe. And um, so it is, I, I do agree with that, putting that in place, but I thought there was already something in place. Um, and then for the requirements for the providers that are exempt, um, is that the ones that you're talking about the FFNs? Uh, is that, are you asking Matt that question or Dave, excuse me? The the last one, the where it says, if exemptions if, are allowed, is that talking about um, FFNs? Oh, that is a great question. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the correct answer on that. Um, perhaps maybe someone else that was involved in this recommendation would be able to clarify that. If not, we'll make sure that that's clarified. Well, the, the reason why I'm asking is because um, they are already registered and they already have um, first a CPR and it's already mandated to have the background checks and they're also doing um, uh, the, what's it called? Electronic attendance and all of those trainings. Um, and the reason why I know, because I already work with them um, at the, I work with the Imagine Institute helping um, FFNs and licensed childcare providers. So I know they already have those regulations. That's the reason why I want to um, ask if, if that's the wording that you're using, that, because that's what they're called, um, exempt, exempt license, and, and that's what they're called, FFNs. The Family, intent, friends, and neighbors? Yeah, the intent of that bullet was to require all the folks that haven't even applied for exempt care, all the folks that are just doing it in the community, everyone to be um, on a list somewhere. And when licensing came to one of these meetings, it was explained that they really don't have a mechanism to require unlicensed providers um, pay fines. They can find them, but they can't really do much about it. Really, all that they will do is if somebody reports an unlicensed person, license, a licensor will be sent out and they will poke their head in to make sure that everybody looks safe, but that's the extent of it. I can help Thank clarify you. as well, Lorena. So um, yes, FFN providers are a type of license exempt uh, provider. But like Julie was saying, there are also people who run whole centers. Uh, and if they are under four hours, they, according to RCW, our law, technically don't need to have a license from DCYF. 
those programs, I believe, are the ones being asked to be included in some kind of registry. That's how I read that recommendation. Thank you for the clarification. And I, and I do know some places that do have that type of business. Well, and there's other types of exempt care too. There's programs on military bases, on tribal land. Um, there's a number of exemptions. But are, I think you're talking about illegal care in a different way than exemptions, right? Uh, th that's that's the one on the second in the second bullet point right. uh, where it says people who are operating unlicensed. Um, that's that's the one that I that mm -hmm. I talked about first at the beginning. That is unsafe, and then the the the, the last one. Um, I just wanted to find out if if they were talking about that because they already have all of those trainings um the FFNs. But now that she explained that it's the the ones like the 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 ones that do outdoors or um, programs like um, La Casa Hogar, they have a program, they only run less than four hours. And, and if they do less than four hours, then they don't have to have um, any type of those trainings or anything like that, or be um, part of the merit or have background checks or anything. So I now I do understand that part. Thank you all. Uh, Lois, it looks like you have your hand up. Sorry about that delay, Eric. Yes, I just want to, and I don't even know how we can do this, but if you think about all these amazing recommendations that this group has come up with, um, I don't know how, like this is important, but how, <sighs> how we can say that, yes, we want to, you know, make sure children that unlicensed care is held accountable, but out of all the recommendations, that one shouldn't rise to the top. Um, Did you say should I, or shouldn't? Should not. Okay. And I'm not saying that it's not important, but I right, think right. that that's one that, um, it's like, oh, those licensors that we were going to use to man the call center that you recommended, we're now going to utilize them to hunt down unlicensed care. So I just want to make sure we're very clear about where this recommendation should fall and that we don't want the resources for all the other important. I'm, OK, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean this isn't important, but I think you guys understand what I'm saying, that this should be at the bottom of the considerations for the department with the rest of the recommendations that will um, support all providers because this may be an issue in some communities, not so much in others, where the other recommendations we have will help everyone no matter what community you're in. That's just my suggestion for the group. Thank you, Lois. Okay, well, why don't we hop on to the, well, let me make sure this is the last one. Okay, it is the last one. Uh, wonderful. So uh, three recommendations remaining. Uh, the first, a provider rights and resources document should be created by an outside organization utilizing the liberatory design process in partnership with DCYF, provider supports, ELAC, WCCA, represented and non-represented family home providers, FFN, WCFC, et cetera. A status update on the internal review panel process for which some providers applied and were selected to join, but have yet to be contacted, should be provided to ELAC, who we recommend determine accountability measures. Quarterly updates should be provided to all providers and ELAC. Lastly, the rulemaking process should have a step-by-step -step guide so that providers are made aware of the process, including how to appeal a decision or submit a petition. Recognizing the urgency, the step-by-step -step guide should be available by March 31st, 2023. With that, I open it up to the room.
This is Sandra Nelson. I remember uh, that uh, another subcommittee that I was on uh, was looking at some provider rights and 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 uh, resources documents from other states that are already being used so that we won't have to recreate the wheel. So uh, I think that one is very doable. And I think, I think uh, that brings more professionalism to our, to our community uh, and the services that we provide. I think there should be something in there about transparency when it comes to the bullet number three, because I think we were all aware of the petition when the parents submitted about the diapering privacy, but um, we had a work group that submitted three petitions. Um, one of them was on toothbrushing. One of the, uh, I forget what they were on, but they were all denied and nobody ever knew about them. So there should be transparency if a petition is um, submitted to change a WAC. Do you mean like a notice? When, like if somebody submits a petition, some well, it was in the newsletter. Notice. Like there was a there was a newsletter that included that a parent had submitted a petition to change the WAC about um, privacy for diapering, mm -hmm. and that the department was going to consider um, modifying the WAC because of that, and they were going to come to some of the committees like provider supports and have a discussion about it. And I feel like that same type of statement should be included in the newsletter each time a petition is submitted. Okay. That's good, Julie. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to share on the last three recommendations or perhaps even of um, all the recommendations that, that we've gone through. Um, we still have about 12 minutes left, so I'd open the room for- I, I was discussion. just gonna note that I think in one of the, me the meeting that Sandra was referencing with regard to provider rights and resources, I think I shared um, the one from, I think it's the state of Utah, and I believe DCYF staff took note of that. I believe that is correct. Okay, so we at least have something to work from. Should a third an out a third party or whatever, you know, to, if we have to do it internally, we at least have something. Or if we can do the liberatory design process, which would be fantastic, we can also okay. use that as an example. Very good. Good. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure that's that's captured in, in the minutes. Well, fantastic. Um, thank you all for for guiding me through this process. This I am honestly pretty honored to to be part of this and hear all of your um, your feedback and your hard work and and some of the great things that you do for for the children that that are are in your care. Um, so if we don't say it enough, we are very appreciative for all the all the things you do. Um, and that Sorry, wasn't just a suck great, up. Sorry, you've done a great job today. Oh, thank you, Julie. Good. You and really and that wasn't a suck up to the, the next slide, which is overall, how do you feel about today's meeting? Was it productive and a good use of your time? Um, yeah, I think Eric, I have to, uh, yes. Eric, I'm sorry, I have to cut in to um, forgive me, but I just wanna thank you. You did an amazing job facilitating today and all oh, the different you. meetings I've attended. Um, just the respect for the comments that you showed and. Um, just the general flow of the meeting. I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the EO executive team. That's nice. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty honored to be part of this. Um, so with that, now you can rate rate me or rate us. Uh, let me grab the link here. And forgive me if I fumble through this. Okay, I think I'm going to put this in chat and then 
uh, somehow miraculously, it's all going to just show up like magic on this screen. So if you could please take a moment to click on the Menti link and rate how you feel about today's meeting. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to know when everyone has voted. I think you just got to call it at a certain point. Call it. That's <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, well, that that concludes. That concludes today's meeting. Um, thank you all for your participation. And I think as a follow-up step, uh, we'll make sure we'll get working on uh, the addendum that we spoke about. And and then uh, that, in, in addition to the a feedback loop, I think would be appropriate, at least with the addendum. Um, and and then we'll make sure to close that back up. I'm not 100% sure how we'll do that, but I know that Aaron will be able to, to help me facilitate through that. Um, and um, thank you all, I, I guess, with that. And Aliza, thank you, Aliza. And thank you, Dave, for being here. You both were fantastic. Um, with your help. I didn't even realize you were going to be here helping. So that was uh, a definite um, bright star. So thank you both. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday. And uh, I guess we won't see you before Thanksgiving. Happy holidays to all those that, that celebrate. And we'll let you go. Thank you very much. Is This is the last meeting. Is that this this is the last yes the last uh, call it scheduled meeting. Right. You should have had some confetti or something coming up. Gosh, yeah, oh really, boy, if I even um, knew, let me see if I can. I don't want to press something wrong. I'd probably get the mouse ears or something, and then I. Well, <laughs> can, well there was a we request go. that we have Senator Wilson and Rep Sen on since this was a product of their legislation. Is that in work? Yes, yes, that's correct. Yes. So what we're looking at doing is. Um, having a special meeting with that would have uh, Senator Wilson and and Representative Sen um, involved, and and bringing I, I believe ELAC and provider supports together, and then this group obviously, and then um, really kind of going through the recommendation report and and kind of hearing it from from their eyes. I think so. Yes, Julie, that is in the works. So we will have well, more follow up for sure. This won't just be the last thing we're like, hey, everybody, see you later. We're all done. Um, I'll make sure that that we get the next steps in place. And and again, the addendum incorporated and then um, working most likely through ELAC and provider supports to make sure that we get that meeting scheduled. Right. Uh, Aaron, Alisa, Dave, want to thank you as well, you know, and Mark. My culture growing up, you're supposed to give people their flowers while they're alive. So I want to thank you guys all for everything um, and making this process go through, even though I know that there have been ups and downs, but just having you facilitate and, and having the other staff support Aaron and Eric and Deanna when she was here has been helpful. So I thank everyone too, on behalf of the Early Learning Advisory Council for your time in this process. Enrica and I are extremely grateful and appreciative of you. And I also think we should give flowers while people are alive. And so Lois and all of the rest of the committee, I mean, the, the intention and commitment and clarity and focus on this work that you all have shown over a year and more than a year when you were advocating for this space as well is uh, really just a, a phenomenal show of uh, your passion. And I'm, you know, I'm super grateful. And just on behalf of DCYF and the licensing division, you know, a lot of this is really invaluable um, information. And I'm, you know, definitely committed to doing whatever I can to follow up on uh, these things that we need uh, for 
for you all and also uh, the kids. So thank you so much. Well said. Well thank said. You. Thank you. I enjoyed this meeting today. Good. Thank you. We're we're glad that we got to be part of it. Yeah. Um, any more questions? You guys are, I mean, for those of you that are still here, if, if we still have four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just thank you all for your hard work and for uh, acknowledging the, the people on this call today, the, our commitment as well, because this work is hard, but it's important. And um, as much as I hate to say it, I do kind of look forward to having a few more hours back in my schedule, because as some of you know, I have been working in ratio every day because of staffing. And we so we have to solve these problems and get more people interested in working in this field. Really well said. That's a mic drop right there. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, bye everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. <laughs>